Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul Lutheran on this, the third Sunday of Easter. Good to be back with you after a week of vacation. Big thanks again to Dave Cruz for leading you in worship last week. A couple of announcements before we begin, starting with two things that are happening today. This afternoon at 1.30, the Junior Lutherans are going to be leaving to go do a little bowling in Lamar's. They're going to show Pastor Aaron just how bad he is uh, at bowling, so uh, make sure you bring your A game. I'm sure it will be a good time. Parents, I'll be in contact with you as to what time we're going to be back. Should be shortly before or around that supper hour. Also this evening, we're starting our couples book study on the book Team Us. You've seen this uh, in the bulletin, on Facebook, in the newsletter. Uh, if you have bought that book and are ready to come and discuss, go ahead and join us tonight at 7 o'clock. Um, I can tell you Sarah and I have been using it together, and it's been very fruitful for us just to reinvest uh, in our marriage amidst the busy chaos of life. Um, if you are planning to get the book but it isn't here yet, still come tonight for the discussion. It will be uh, fruitful for you during that time as well. Please be mindful of the announcement about uh, Vacation Bible School that is going to be coming up uh, this summer in Hull from June 6th to June 10th. The registration time for that uh, is coming at the beginning of May, so please pay close attention. And then Sunday School parents, please note the announcement about our end of the year trip on May 2nd. Uh, we are gonna take the Sunday school kids into Sioux Falls for a movie. Uh, thanks to COVID, you can now rent your own movie theater. Did you know that? Just have it all to yourself. Uh, so we have reserved a movie theater showing for our Sunday school kids. Uh, we need a head count on that, not this uh, next Monday tomorrow, but a week from Monday. Uh, and once we get a number on kids, we may be able to invite a few of you parents to join us as well. You can see in your bulletin the things happening in our congregation this week. Please note confirmation and adult Bible study will meet as normal on Wednesday. Those are my announcements. Any from the congregation before we begin worship? Then I'll ask that you please rise as you're able and join me in our call to worship found printed on the screen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the promise giver, the source of love, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Out of the darkness of grief and despair comes a message of hope. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. The grave is empty. Jesus lives. I will not die, but instead will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Lord Jesus, risen Savior, you have changed sadness into joy. You have taken away all sorrow and replaced it with your peace. I will not be silent. I will sing praise and give thanks to my God forever and ever. Amen. We sing our opening hymn together, Alleluia, Jesus is Risen. It can be found in the blue with one voice hymnal number 674, and we will sing verses 1, 2, 4, and 5.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Called and gathered together by the Holy Spirit, let us come humbly before God and our brothers and sisters in the faith, confessing our sins, known and unknown, trusting in God's gracious word of forgiveness, our merciful Father who brings life out of death, and transforms us into new creatures through his redeeming word, knows the depths of our hearts. Let us make a confession of our sin. But first, let us reflect on those sins and all of those things that seek to tear us away from God, not just today, but every day. Lord Jesus, risen Savior, we come to you in sorrow for our faults and confess to you our weakness and unbelief. Although in Christ our light has come, we too often prefer the darkness of sin. Forgive us, fill us with your spirit, and free us from the shackles of our failings. Give us once again the joy of your salvation and make us instruments of peace and love in the world. Amen. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glorious mercy of the Lord shines around you. In the name and by the authority of your Savior, Jesus Christ, I announce the forgiveness of all your sins. May the Holy Spirit strengthen your faith, heal your troubled spirit, and equip you to proclaim the greatness of the Lord until the day he comes again. Amen. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. God of abundance, you make yourself known to us in the breaking of bread and reveal to us the mystery of your life, death, and resurrection through the scriptures. Embolden us to live our lives in ways that bear witness to who we are, one in Je Jesus our Lord. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Any children that are with us that would like to come up for children's chat can do so at this time. Good morning. Hello, everybody. Come on up. Come on up. Hi, Emberly. Good to see you. You want to come sit? Yeah. All right. What's a scar? What's a scar? Anyone know what a scar is, Maddie? It's like a cut that doesn't really go away. Oh, it's like a cut that doesn't really go away. What else can we say about a scar? It's a mark. It's a Oh, I like that. Say that louder. It's a mark that stays there after you get hurt. Look here. This is a scar. It's not like a real big one because I really didn't play that hard as a kid. I was kind of an indoor kid. I was a real wimp. But when I was in high school, I worked at a steakhouse. And I took a knife and I was cutting a piece of steak one night. And I don't know what I was doing. I was talking with someone. I know you find that really hard to believe, but I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. And what do you think I did with that knife? I cut my finger. I cut myself right here, right into my hand, and it bled and it bled and it bled, and I had to take care of it for a really long time, but now it healed and there's a scar. Anyone else have a scar? Dylan? How'd you get the scar? Oh, you do have a scar on your knee. Oh, you had, sometimes we get scars from surgery. One on each knee and each hip, and you look at those scars, and you remember that you had surgery. Maddie? You got bit by a dog sometimes. Anyone else have a scar? No scars over here? Farm kids, you haven't fallen down and gone boom and hurt yourself? Any other scars? Anyone have a scar? Sometimes from surgery, sometimes from animals. Sometimes we just bump into something, um, and we get a scar. It hurts us. 
But I was thinking this week, are scars only on the outside? Do scars only grow on the outside? Sometimes we get scars on the inside, like on our hearts. Sometimes we get scars and we get wounds when someone says something that isn't very nice to us, right? And that hurts you in your heart. And sometimes you do something wrong and you know you shouldn't have done it and you feel this thing called guilt. And you might get a little scar on your mind because it just reminds you that you've done something wrong. And sometimes someone you love dies. Or sometimes someone you love gets really, really sick. I know that's happened to us and we get a scar on our soul or in our feelings and we get a scar there because we've been hurt. Today in our gospel text, you're going to hear Jesus talk about his scars. It's the night of Easter, and he shows up in front of his disciples, and they've kind of got some scars on their hearts and in their souls and on their minds because they're sad that Jesus had died. They didn't know yet that he had risen, and they're kind of feeling guilty that they hadn't done anything to stop his death, and they're wondering what's going to happen in the future, and they've got all these scars on the inside of their body, And Jesus shows up and he says, look at my hands and look at my feet. And what do you think are on his hands and feet? Holes and scars from where they put the nails into his hands and his feet. And he says, guess what? I got my scars so that I can help heal your scars. So that even though I'm going to go back to heaven someday, Jesus says, after he's resurrected from the dead, my scars... Make it so that I'm going to help heal your heart when you're sad. And I'm going to help heal your soul or your feelings when you're worried. And I'm going to help heal your mind, the scar in your mind, when you've done something wrong and you need someone to forgive you. This is the Jesus that we serve. Do we ask for scars very often? Do we ask to get scars? Do we ask to get hurt? Have you ever asked to get hurt before? No. Does it feel good to get hurt? No. But guess what? Jesus got scars for us on his hands, on his feet. He did this so that we can know that he is always with us. Okay, let's fold our hands, bow our heads, and repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to get scars on the cross so my scars can be healed. Help me to know that he is with me when I'm sad or lonely or angry or worried. In his name, amen. Okay, here's the deal. I told myself I was going to get candy to start giving candy out at children's sermon again, and do you think I did it this week? So you tell your mom and dad that they need to text me this week to get candy for children's sermon, okay? You say, Send a text to Pastor Aaron that he needs to pick up candy so that we can get candy at Children's Sermon next week, okay? All right, and we'll see if I do it. All right, you can go back and sit down. Thank you. Okay, our first reading is taken from Acts 3, verses 11 through 21, and that's found in your Pew Bible on 1695, beginning with verse 11. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colomade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate though he had decided to let him go. You disown the Holy and the Righteous One 
and ask that a murder be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man, whom you see and know, was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can, call, can all see. Now, brothers, I know you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying, that his Christ would suffer, repent then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that the times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send Christ, who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must, be, he must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Our response of reading is Psalm 4, and that is on the screen as well, on page 845 of your Bible. Answer me when I call to you, O my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. How long, O men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has sent apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call to him. In your anger, do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. Many are asking, who can show us any good? Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have filled my heart with greater joy than when the grain and the new wine abound. I will lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Our second reading is taken from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, we are the children of God, and what we will has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him, he, we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law, in fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. And that concludes our readings. Does anyone not love the sound of a crying baby in church? That's a good sound, right? Let's rejoice in that, right? Uh, let's stand as we hear from our Holy Gospel this morning. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, Christ, our Lord and God. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. 
When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet, and while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you, Christ, our Lord and God. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you this day from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. There are no four words in the English language that can spark a fight between a husband and wife faster than these ones. I told you so. On vacation last week, my foot was a little heavy on the gas pedal. And Sarah said, you better slow down or you're going to end up getting pulled over. So I set the cruise a smidgen higher. Guess what? I met a very nice police officer just north of Sioux Falls on the interstate who only gave me a warning, but my wife could still say those four words, I told you so. This winter I was moving some heavy boxes in the basement And Sarah said, why don't you let me help you with those? And I, being the strong man that Sarah married, said, I think I can handle it. Guess what? Hull has a very nice chiropractor who wrote me a prescription for listening to my wife more often, is what he wrote. I told you so. These are Jesus' words to his very wearied disciples this morning. If portions of this gospel text sound familiar, they should. Today we are getting Luke's version of John's gospel text from last week, but Luke gives us a little bit more of the story. Luke records the portion of Jesus' sermon that John omits. It is, once again, the night of Jesus' resurrection, and right prior to this, we hear the story of Cleopas and his traveling companion on the road to Emmaus. The resurrected Jesus appears to them as they walk, although they mistake him for a stranger at first. Jesus broke bread with them, eventually revealed his true identity as the one who conquered the grave and then disappeared. Well, this story couldn't be kept to themselves, so the men head back to Jerusalem and they find the disciples and they tell them that they, like the women at the tomb that morning, had seen the Lord. And that's where our gospel begins. Cleopas and his unnamed friend are trying desperately to convince the apostles that Christ has indeed broken out of the tomb when he appears, Jesus, in the flesh. And we know that he is in the flesh because Luke gives us unmistakable evidence. Remember, Luke was a physician. He adds details to his gospel that no other gospel writers think of because as a doctor, he is obsessed with the body. So even though these men think they are seeing a ghost, Luke adds a detail that John left out. He tells them, that after three days in the tomb, Jesus was hungry. Christ sits as he did with these men on the night of his arrest, again with his betrayers to share a meal. And in this, there can be no doubt. Jesus was back from the dead and had physically overthrown his mausoleum. Now, This is, after all, the crux of not just the Easter season, but of our Christian faith. Our Savior did not remain dead, but came back to life. 
so that we too might come back to life after our own death. But there is a part of this encounter between the risen Lord and his disciples that does not sit well with me. Upon appearing in their midst, Jesus speaks the greeting of peace, but it's his next question that rubs me wrong. Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your minds? Well, I don't know, Jesus. It's not like we didn't just see three days ago you hoisted up on a cross naked and humiliated before the world to die a slow and agonizing death. It's not like we didn't just watch your body be wrapped in a shroud and laid in a tomb and sealed shut with guards posted outside. It's not like when we heard the thud of the stone roll in front of the grave that we mourned all of our hopes and fears that we'd placed on you. Jesus, don't you understand? We are afraid for our lives that the Jews are going to come find us and do to us what they did to you. We have no future apart from you. We are angry and disappointed that you would let this happen to yourself. Dear friends in Christ, pardon my curtness, but this sounds like a pretty dumb question. Why are you troubled? Well, where should I start? There's rioting in the Twin Cities again. There seems to be a mass shooting every few days. An Iowa Iowa Highway Patrolman was gunned down last week. Why do doubts arise in my mind? Fill in the blanks, people. An unexpected cancer diagnosis has rocked me to my core. I have to put my parents in the nursing home. My sibling just went on hospice. I'm worried about an upcoming procedure. I lay in bed at night and churn over the ways in my mind that my life could fall apart. My kids won't speak to one another. I don't know if I should get the COVID vaccine or not. I was unfaithful in my marriage. My gambling addiction is getting out of hand. People of God at St. Paul Lutheran, you know what is troubling your hearts and minds. You know why doubts arise. And now this Jesus has the gall to show up in our lives and ask, why? But maybe, just maybe, Jesus isn't asking why because he's ambivalent to our suffering like we might think he is. Maybe Jesus isn't asking why because he could care less. Maybe he's saying, why are you troubled? Why are you doubting? When I told you so. I told you in my Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, and blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I told you on a stormy sea of Galilee that not even the wind and the waves are a match for me. I told you once the paralytic was lowered through the roof in Capernaum that I am the Lord over sickness. I told you at the grave of Lazarus that death really isn't my foe. I told you in the land of the Gerasenes that Satan has no power over the Son of God. I told you at Zacchaeus' dining room table that the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. I told you the night that you handed me over for crucifixion by the Romans that you should take heart because I have overcome the world. I told you so. And then Jesus continues, not only did I tell you so, But my father's told you so, and the scripture has told you so. As he did for the men on the road to Emmaus, our Lord Jesus goes to work opening the eyes of his disciples and says, Can't you see? This book is all about me because this is my story. This Bible can seem so daunting and overwhelming. If someone were to sit down at your kitchen table or even show up to a Bible study here at St. Paul Lutheran and ask, what's in this book? We'd be liable to run for the hills in fear because how could we possibly take these texts, this library, which took over a thousand years to compile and give a synopsis of it? Well, Jesus tells us how. 
From Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden and God promised that one day he would send a Savior to fix it all, this book is a story of a good and gracious creator chasing down his rebellious creatures who are slaves to sin. This living word, breathed out by the Holy Spirit through human hands, is God's rescue plan to save you and I from sin, death, and the devil. As Jesus tells his disciples, the promise of a redeemer is held throughout the books of law and history and prophecy and wisdom. The promise of a redeemer is held throughout the stories of Noah and Abraham and Moses and King David. This is one long unfolding tale of a group of people waiting on God to deliver them. And Jesus says, I am that deliverer. I told you so. The babe of Bethlehem took on human flesh, and throughout his ministry, the pierced hands that he showcases on this Easter night multiplied bread and fish, and they pulled Peter up out of a raging sea, and he reached out with them to touch the lepers. The pierced feet that he showcases on this Easter night walked him into undeserving pagan lands to heal the sick and into the home of Jairus to raise his dead daughter and to the woman at the well who needed her heart healed. Why? Why should the rescuer of man, the redeemer of humanity, suffer and die? For the forgiveness of sins. There it is. Jesus says it. We read it in black and white. So that you, dear hearers of God's most holy and precious word, do not have to walk out of this sanctuary today or lay your head on your pillow tonight or let your feet hit the floor in the morning without knowing this. Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, the one on whom this whole book centers, the promised Savior, suffered and rose from the dead for your troubled hearts and lives again for your doubt-stricken mind. So when anxiety pierces us to our core in the doctor's office, in the funeral home, in the courtroom, when apprehensions cloud our thoughts as we watch the evening news and lay in bed at night concerned over the fates of our children or grandchildren or we weigh a tough and impossible decision that is before us, when we are concerned, perplexed, or at the end of our rope, when we are frightened, tormented, or stuck in the depths of grief, We hear the words of Jesus. I told you so. I told you in the waters of your baptism that you are mine. I told you on the cross that I forgive your sin. I told you in my empty tomb that I have tasted of death so that you will never have to taste of death. And in these pages of scripture, time and time again, I have told you that I am not only for you, but I am with you. I told you so. Amen. You may remain seated as we sing our hymn of the day. We sing, He Lives. It's number 550 in the praise hymnals, which can be found at the end of your pews.
under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious Father, the Apostle John wrote in his first letter that your love for us is so great that you would even dare call us your children. When our hearts are anxious and afraid, when our minds are doubtful and hesitant, show up as you did on that first Easter night and say, I told you so. I told you my love was for you. I told you I will care for you. I told you I will forgive you. And then send us out with these words on our lips. Using these people gathered at St. Paul Lutheran to be your witnesses in an ancient and fearful world. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of the nations, raise up for each nation of the world leaders who would seek out your ways in all their dealings. Use the hands of our elected or appointed officials, especially those here in the United States, to fight against lawlessness and division, that we might be a nation that lives in peace and not discord. Forgive our representatives when they wander from your will and uphold them in their quest to provide for the care of your people. Extend your hand to touch President Biden, Vice President Harris, Governor Reynolds, and all federal, state, and local representatives from Washington to Hull. Lord, in your mercy. God of humanity, King David prayed for relief, deliverance, and faith in his psalm this morning. Bring these gifts, relief, deliverance, faith to those who put themselves, others before themselves, those who think of their fellow man before themselves. We pray this day for the men and women of the United States Armed Forces, emergency service workers, first responders, and especially our law enforcement community in a time when our police officers come under such condemnation, scrutiny, and even death in the name of peace. Give them courage and determination. Tend to the fallen and their injuries, emotional or physical, and comfort families awaiting their return at home. Lord, in your mercy. Father of all mercy and consolation, your son Jesus showed the marks of his crucifixion in front of his disciples. And this brought them gladness and peace in the midst of their unbelief and despair. Bring gladness and peace to all those who battle illness of mind, body, or spirit, that they too might know the consolation of your love and favor. We especially remember all those we name in the silence of our hearts before you. Lord, in your mercy. In your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, dear people of God, go from this place into your day, into your week, with this benediction and blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join in singing our sending hymn, Good Christian Friends Rejoice and Sing, number 144 in the Green Hymnal.
Go in peace to love and serve the crucified and living Lord who died and rose for you. 